Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, I, I should apologize for the rain, but this is Brussels, so I, I don't really have to, uh, because this is um, expected. But it should encourage us all to stay here in this room as we listen to the contributions uh, for the rest of the day. So. Uh, I'm delighted and honoured to host uh, this colloquium today and I would like to thank all of those who have worked so hard and given so generously of their time to make it happen. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Herwig Hoffman and Professor Jacques Ziller for their immense contribution to the preparations for today. And I would also like to pay a special tribute to my Secretary General, Mr Ian Harden, who drove this initiative. Ian, as many of you uh, may know, will retire next month after 19 years of service to this institution. And I hope that today, as he listens to the various contributions and reflections, that he will rightly take pride in the immense role that he has played in bringing the European Ombudsman to what I consider to be a very healthy state of development. Ian's successor, Ms. Beate Geminder, is also with us today, and I hope that she will consider this as an early immersion, a crash course in what lies ahead. On a personal level, I'm also delighted to welcome two of my former colleagues from the Ombudsman community, Mats Malin, former Chief Ombudsman of Sweden and now President of the Swedish Supreme Administrative Court, and Alex Brennickmeyer, former Ombudsman for the Netherlands and now a member of the EU Court of Auditors. And to all our other colleagues and friends, a very warm welcome also to you. I am particularly glad that the first European Ombudsman, the person who arguably had the most difficult job, Jakob Soderman, is here today to share with us the journey that he made for 10 years. My immediate predecessor, Professor Nikki Forosi Amandouris, is however in the process of recovering from an illness and while he is well over the worst, his doctors advised him not to travel. I spoke to him last night. He sends his warmest wishes to all of you. And in turn, I think many speakers here today will also warmly remember Nicky Forrest's great contribution to this institution. He particularly asked me to say that as someone who values historical and institutional memory, that he is immensely pleased that today's colloquium will lead to the publication of a companion volume to that produced for the 10-year anniversary in 2005. A 20th anniversary is, of course, a milestone event. It shows that an institution has at least survived infancy and adolescence and is now, hopefully, entering its more mature years. But survival is never enough for any organisation. The process of renewal is unceasing. The foundations and the hinterland constantly change. No organisation can rest on its past achievements or fail to adapt to the demands of an ever-changing and restless political economic and administrative environment. Jakob will shortly describe his experiences of his challenges and others will reflect profoundly on the forces that have shaped the European Ombudsman and how in turn the European Ombudsman has shaped the administration of the European Union. For my part, I would like to reflect on my still relatively brief time in office to date and describe the strategy that I have adopted to try to live up to the responsibility vested in me by the people through the European Parliament to lead this institution and to bring it onto the next level of relevance and of effectiveness. My starting point is a simple question. What does it say on the tin, on the side of the can? What is the European Ombudsman supposed to do? Again, a simple answer. As once you distill the essence of Maastricht, of Lisbon, and of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it is clear that the Ombudsman is there, in a complementary role to that of the courts, to make sure that the EU institutions do not abuse or misuse their powers. And in doing that, it helps to support democracy and so enhances the democratic legitimacy of the European Union. The potential scope of its work is therefore very broad indeed, defined by, of course, its statute, but also by the ambition of the vision of the Ombudsman. A narrow description of this institution as a complaint handling body fails, therefore, to give adequate expression to its deeper role as an embedder of democracy, as a driver of change in a culture that still lacks the requisite levels of accountability and transparency appropriate to institutions crafted from the finest European ideals. The complaints central to our work do solve individual problems, but they are also the drivers of change the vehicles through which we can tackle wider systemic problems. So how does the European Ombudsman carve out a zone of operations for itself, and how does it actually embed democracy? My predecessors created, 
deepened and widened that space from small and tentative beginnings, and I am attempting to continue to do so. And so to that end, I do not see this office as a place somewhat set apart from the mainstream dominant institutions, a niche institution that deals with disaffected citizens <coughs> when the bigger ones have failed to do so. Rather, I see it as the duty of this office, when it legitimately can, to engage with the bigger issues of the EU, to find ways in which its own unique powers can provide a positive and useful influence. I therefore, from day one, decided to increase the use of own initiative investigation powers. I appointed an own initiative coordinator whose role is, in collaboration with her colleagues, to identify problematic issues to which we could make a useful contribution and then to carry out an efficient and effective investigation. To date, we have completed or launched investigations into the transparency of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations between the EU and the United States, the Commission's response to the European Citizens Initiative, the appointment of expert groups to the European Commission, the manner in which the Commission deals with potential conflicts of interest arising from the so-called revolving doors <laughs> phenomenon, and we are about to begin an investigation close to the heart of EU decision-making, that is, into the transparency of the trilogue procedure, that method of decision-making whereby the Council and the Parliament, alongside the Commission, come together, in effect, to hammer out legislative deals on matters that will ultimately affect us all. And the common denominator of those investigations is, essentially, influence. How are laws and other decisions made? Who are the key influencers in EU decision-making? Who or what has brought their thinking or interest to bear on what ultimately emerges from the process to land on the doorstep of every EU citizen? I cannot and should not make judgments on laws democratically agreed by the Parliament and the Council. But what I can do is attempt to make sure that those outside the trilogue doors or the Commission offices or the Council chambers are given the transparency they need and are entitled to in order to affect accountability, an accountability that in turn confers democratic legitimacy onto the institutions of the European Union. I also encourage my colleagues to be proactive in recognising issues that suddenly crop up outside of the routine caseload where we could seek to influence a positive outcome. Some weeks ago, some of you may have read, a private meeting of, among others, hedge fund and other investors took place in London, at which a speech was delivered by a director of the European Central Bank. During the speech, he revealed certain market-sensitive information, information that was not formally publicly released until the following day, thus giving rise to some negative media and other commentary about privileged access. The ECB quickly denied any such intent on its part, and said that the incident arose from an administrative error that had caused a delay between speech delivery and speech publication. I had no reason to doubt that this was indeed the case, but I wrote nonetheless to the ECB President Mario Draghi asking him to account for the error and to outline what steps the ECB proposed to take to avoid those in future. In his reply, the President explained what had happened, but also announced his intention to review the bank's protocols in relation to its speech and other engagements. I look forward to the outcome of that review and the concrete proposals that may emerge. I would also like to thank President Draghi for his prompt and engaged response and for his stated commitment to reviewing existing protocols. I mention that case as it makes, in quite a graphic way, the link between a simple act of poor administration in this case, a technical glitch, and issues of democratic accountability and legitimacy. In querying the error, the Ombudsman was able to track a path from computer glitch through to a wider exploration of how a powerful EU institution, such as the ECB, ensures that private interests are not preferred over those, those of the ordinary citizen, with zero or limited access to events of the kind I have just described. Equally, through an own initiative investigation into the Commission's handling of revolving doors cases, we have attempted to support the Commission in its commitment to ensuring that privileged access by private interest is not unwittingly secured when public officials are hired in the private sector. <laughs> in many cases, those hires are clearly for the purpose of extracting intelligence and information about decisions that may impact on the bottom lines of those same private interests. Again, the point of the investigation is to make sure that the democratic and public interest is protected. 
And in addition to those investigations, I have also begun to work with my colleagues in the network of European Ombudsmen to find common issues into which we can conduct parallel investigations. The first of those has been completed this year and concerns the protection of people denied asylum in the EU and who are being flown out of various member states on the return flights coordinated by the EU border agency Frontex. I have been enabled to do this work through the efforts of my two predecessors and our wonderful staff, the men who laid the foundations and began to construct the walls of this institution. But I've also been enabled to do it because the institutions that are frequently the subject of my investigations and at times criticism continue to accept and respect the role of the Ombudsman within the wider public administration. They support the European Ombudsman not because they are legally obliged to accept a recommendation, they are not, but because their own respect for democracy and perhaps their awareness of its fragility entails supporting and engaging with an institution that is there precisely to ensure democratic legitimacy. And despite the criticisms levelled against the institutions at times, it is to the credit of the very many dedicated and remarkable people who work in those institutions that they so very often accept that criticism with good grace and move to improve the quality of the service that they give to the public. Equally, this institution may not have survived as well as it has done were it not for the engaged support and commitment of the European Parliament and in particular of the Petitions Committee to whom the Ombudsman reports. Tomorrow I will present my annual report to the committee and I look forward to discussing its contents with the members led by committee chairperson Cecilia Wigstrom who will also join us today. That relationship is arguably the most critical of all and it is one I greatly respect and value. Every ombudsman needs to be able to rely on parliament in those cases which should be rare when an institution refuses to accept an important recommendation. We are, as everybody is aware, at a period of great crisis yet again in the EU. Today, the Eurozone Summit meets to resolve a problem that, if not resolved, may lead to unimagined, even grave consequences. My ambition does not go so far as to suggest that I can sort out that one, but this much I do know, that questions around legitimacy, transparent decision-making, the quality of public administration, concern for the lived lives of EU citizens and fairness go to the heart of this and many other EU problems. The people demand not just fair decision making, but they also demand an administration that is open in its dealings with them, that does not resort to arcane points of law or obscure principle in order to avoid an accounting for their actions. The people, and above all at times of crisis, need an administration with a soul and with a conscience. On the occasion of the 20th anniversary of this office, I would call on all the institutions, and particularly on their leaders, to step back and appraise the degree to which their institution steps up to that particular plate. Reflect on your transparency. Reflect on the service you provide to the public. Reflect on the ethical base of what you do. Honestly reflect on these things and work with your people and with this institution to provide a standard of accountable, transparent and legitimate leadership that can serve as an example to others both here and in the Member States. And I, in turn, will commit this institution to doing all in its power to assist you in that work and also to make sure that it too adopts the highest standards. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce the man who, as I said earlier, had the most difficult task of all three of the European Ombudsman, the founding European Ombudsman, Mr Jakob Soderman. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the possibility to say a few words on this important occasion. It's almost 20 years since I was elected as the first European Ombudsman and 12 years since I left office. 
Many achievements from the first years appear still to be useful in the Ombudsman's work for the European citizens. At the very beginning, some people had the idea that only the court should deal with matters of legality. Other people had the idea that the Ombudsman could not find maladministration unless the institution had acted illegally. illegally, illegally, illegally. The results would have been no room at all for the European Ombudsman. We managed to establish both that illegality is a form of maladministration and that there are other forms of maladministration as well. It's never good administration to act against the law. But on the other hand, just following the letter of the law might not always be good administration. In carrying out its tasks, the administration must demonstrate respect for the citizen and in all cases fully observe fundamental principles and human rights. In the early years, we realized that the Ombudsman's own initiative power can be used in a broad way to improve relations between EU institutions and citizens. Three landmark subjects of own initiative inquirers in those years were, first, an initiative on access to documents, which led most EU institutions and bodies to adopt rules providing for access to documents over a decade in advance of the Lisbon Treaty. Second, our initiative to draft a proposal on good administration based on the best standards in the member states led to the European Parliament's decisions in 2001 to adopt a code of good administrative behavior. Third, we took an initiative to address the problem of late payment by the Commission, which somewhat got better. To underline the important principle of people's right to know, we took the liberty when needed to initiate and take part in public debate. The most vivid example might be an article in the Wall Street Journal on 24th February 2000, which led to an exchange with Commission President Prodi concerning the Commission's proposals for Regulation 1049-2001 it had the effect of alerting the members of the European Parliament to the importance of openness and public access to documents. The Ombudsman was also invited to take part in the drafting of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. To underline the importance of respect for citizens, we used the occasion to propose that the Charter sh should include a new fundamental right the citizens' right to good administration. Uh, I think the audience was laughing at that proposal in the beginning. But then I described that the risk that the person in, in the member states will be drawn into a cellar and torture is not very overwhelming, but the risk to be badly treated by the administration is, is, is fairly common. So in, in the end, it was, became an article in 41 of the Charter. As well as certain specific rights, the article establishes that citizens are entitled to good administration as a general principle which should be given effect by legislation in the future. Today, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is binding within the sphere of EU law at all levels in the Union. The European public debate 20 years ago was still dominated by the strong quest for a citizens' Europe, which helped to shape the Maastricht Treaty. The Spanish <coughs> government's proposal, 21st February 1991, to establish European citizenship envisaged a broad set of citizens' rights, an idea which one might say finally realized with the adoption of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Spanish proposal included a European Ombudsman who would assist the citizens of the Union to defend these rights against the Member States as well as the EU institutions and bodies. In the negotiations on the Maastricht Treaty, it was obvious that an Ombudsman with such large powers could not find the necessary support among the Member States. Therefore, the Danish government intervened and successfully proposed that the European Ombudsman be established to supervise the EU institutions 
and the bodies with a mandate to uncover and correct maladministration in their activities. As we believed in the importance of creating Citizens Europe, we find it clear that the European Ombudsman should play an important role in ensuring that European citizens enjoy the rights vis-à-vis -vis the, the member states. For this reason, we decided to deal with the concerns expressed by citizens about the Commission's activities as the guardian of the treaty. Mostly such complaints concerned lack of information about the handling and outcome of the complaints made to the Commission. Finally, the Commission accepted the Ombudsman's role and in 2002 issued a communication to the Ombudsman and to the European Parliament containing procedural guarantees for its activities in this field. The statute of the Ombudsman includes a basis for cooperation with national and regional Ombudsman and similar bodies. This led to setting up the European network of Ombudsman, those whose activities have developed in a positive way over the years with annual meetings and seminars. These include the newsletter which this institution can exchange experiences and best practices and in some cases ask for guidance on interpretation of EU law. The European Ombudsman's leading role in the network and its activities should be gradually enforced as it makes it possible that EU law and above all Charter of Fundamental Rights might one day be a living reality all over the European Union. Citizens should not have to look at the Luxembourg Court or the Commission in Brussels or even to the Ombudsman in Strasbourg for their fundamental rights. No, citizens should enjoy these rights on their own doorsteps in the Member States. Here is much work still to be done. The constant encouraging of Ombudsman and similar bodies through the activities of the network is the best way forward to realize the vision of a citizen's Europe. During the years, there was, have also been step backwards. In my speech, 20th anniversary of the Court of First Instance in Luxembourg on the 19th October 1999, I had the possibility to praise the EU courts for their firm attitude in favor of access to documents, in fact, for an open and accountable administration. The case law of the courts on issues of transparency reminded me of the great work of the United States Supreme Court in the 50s and the 60s, when the court insisted on respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms to which other parts of the governmental system were indifferent or even hostile. And so I stated, during its first 10 years, your court has, as I see it, played a similar role in the matter of transparency. I think that the European citizens have noted this with due respect, your role in upholding the law of transparency in community institutions and bodies. For me, it was a true surprise to read the outcome of the Bavaria Lager case where the Court of Justice reversed the approach of the Court of First Instance. The passage in which the Court said that where a request based on regulation 1049-2001 seeks to obtain access of documents including personal data, the provisions of regulation number 45-2001 become applicable in their entirety. Strictly applied, this would make it impossible to secure an open and fully accountable EU administration. The European Data Protection Supervisor at that time, Mr. Peter Hustings, tried unsuccessfully to persuade the court to adopt a more balanced approach, which would require a threshold effect on personal privacy before data protection would trump transparency. After the judgment, he tried to make the best of the situation by encouraging the court EU institutions to be proactive on a voluntary basis in seeking to reconcile data protection requirements with openness. While these effects are welcome, they 
could succeed only if there are a stronger culture of openness at the EU level. As things are, the Bavarian Lager case has dimmed the light of transparency and made it easier for powerful interests to have privileged access to decision makers. Data protection is vitally important in the modern world to protect citizens' personal data, most importantly sensitive personal or family information from surveillance and monitoring by those who are not authorized to do it by law. It should never be used to prevent citizens from scrutinizing the activities of the administration and definitely not actions by powerful lobbies and interests. The Ombudsman Institution is the most successful constitutional project of our time. It has spread all over the world in different versions. In its most classical form, it started in Sweden and Finland a long time ago as a supervisor of legality with strong powers. If a, if a servant in the old days of the state were found to have violated the law, the Ombudsman pros prosecuted him before the court. The modern version of the Ombudsman institution was established in Denmark after the Second World War and mainly concentrated on the fight against maladministration in the growing administration of welfare state. The model reached New Zealand, Australia, and Canada and came back to Europe through Ireland and England. One of its main concerns is setting things right from the complainant's point of view. France introduced Le Mediateur, who could draw on the idea of equité to look for friendly solutions and problems between the state and the citizens. And lastly, we have the Latin American and post-communist versions that both put the observance of human rights first and foremost. The European Ombudsman Statute managed to incorporate the best elements of all these versions in one institution, much to its benefits. Over the years, it has also been a symbol of the institution's readiness to change to be able to fulfill its noble task in new circumstances. Still, one should always remember the very essence of the Ombudsman, its strong commitment to promote the rule of law, the observance of fundamental freedoms and human rights, and above all, the respect for the citizens. Before concluding, I would like to pay tribute to my successor as European Ombudsman, Nicky Foros Diamandouros, is largely as a result of his tireless work that the European Ombudsman today is known and respected not only in Europe, but worldwide. His success demonstrates convincingly that you don't really have to be a lawyer to be an excellent and aspiring Ombudsman. The present incumbent, Emily O'Reilly, has a long and distinguished record of fighting bravely for openness, not only as the National Ombudsman of Ireland, but also as a fearless representative of the free media. I truly believe that she is well qualified to successfully fight the ongoing backdrop for an open, efficient and accountable administration at the EU level and more broadly as well through the colleagues all over Europe. As she was elected with an overwhelming majority by the European Parliament, she has a strong mandate to do so. I wish her every success. Long live the European Ombudsman. Thank you very much indeed, Jakob, and particularly uh, on a personal basis for those, those kind words at the end. Um, we just changed the order slightly because of uh, the absence of, of Nikki Forrest, so I'm now going to call on Harry Hoffman from the University of Luxembourg formally to introduce us to the colloquium. Well, Ombudsman, ladies and gentlemen, um, of course it's a great honour for me to be able to stand here and welcome you uh, after the Ombudsman current and former have spoken to this uh, colloquium, which takes place at a special time. 20 years of Ombuds review, as one could call it, uh, is a remarkable event which deserves not just celebration but reflection on where things have come from, where things can go to, 
and what actually the contribution of the office of the Ombudsman has been so far and what avenues we could think of to develop in the future. And that I say, of course, humbly of never having served uh, neither in the office or the office itself. So uh, I simply, as the other academics uh, and uh, uh, practitioners who are around the table today, uh, will, uh, of course, hopefully come in with a discussion to, to make it a fruitful and, and interesting event. Because the day today is not only a day to discuss these issues, it's also, and I'm, of course, most delighted about that, a day to bring together various authors of a future book um, about the topic we have on, our, on the wall here about the possibilities of Ombuds Review um, to enhance accountability, democracy, or democratic accountability, however you, way you want to turn these phrases. And thank you very much for all of the, the authors uh, to be here. Um, we very much, of course, need also your input um, to make this a good and useful volume. Now, when the Ombudsman's office was created in the 1990s, uh, we just exactly had the same time of the creation of this notion of European citizenship. And of course, concern was quite valid about what will that mean, citizenship, in the European Union. And as you know, when you read the initial articles of citizenship, most of you might have been, as myself, a little underwhelmed. Here comes with big fanfare the idea of citizenship, and what you read in the articles is not much new. It's essentially the term. So the creation of the body of an ombudsman is in itself a very important part because the parliament creates an independent institution which is there in order to support the idea of empowering the individual. And that, I think, is an extremely valid point which in the citizenship debate often gets underestimated. Now, therefore, this is an important point of reflection of how has the Ombudsman's uh, position uh, revolved out of that. Uh, and um, of course, from this starting point, develops the discussion about what is the primary role of the Ombudsman? Is it only ensuring individual rights? Is it the integrity of the institutions and practice? as the last Ombudsman, Nikiforos Diamandouros, who unfortunately isn't here today, um, was coining the phrase integrity institution? Or is it more generally a idea of preventing maladministration, and of course the consideration of what is that actually, um, is still with us today. Um, the two speeches we were just hearing, uh, uh, rich and interesting, show that there's much scope of debate. Now, when we reflect on the future possibilities, of course, we first have to look a little bit into the tasks. The task of the Ombudsman as a specialized supervisory authority um, lives off the strength of the combination of the Ombudsman being a quasi-judicial, quasi-political, and also somewhat administrative body. All of these various powers come together in one institution, which is in that sense, rather atypical. The idea of linking that with a review of European institutions and bodies is the original one. However, I would like to introduce to the debate also the notion that the treaties now in Article 298 speak of European administration. And in that context of European administration, that should be a moment to recall that administration is not just taking place on the European level, but European law is first and foremost also implemented through the member states. And that often the whole idea of union law coming to the citizens, affecting the citizens, is a composite undertaking of European level and member state level. And we should always, when we think about how to go forward with the Ombudsman position, and the Ombudsman Office and the Ombudsman possibilities of review not forget this integrated nature. Now, remarkably, the Ombudsman started out with a highly independent status. The independence is, of course, uh, visible when reading the treaty bases. The Ombudsman 
may only be dismissed by the Court of Justice at the request of the European Parliament under very strict conditions, if no longer fulfills the conditions required for the performance of his duties or is guilty of serious misconduct. That's a very high bar. And the Ombudsman is, other than under an action for damages, now less virtually free of judicial review with regard to the action. We've had, before the Treaty of Lisbon came into force, a case which simply said the Ombudsman was not one of those bodies against which action could be brought. That has been changed. But in the meanwhile, we have a case Schoenberger on the question of the possibility of reviewing the Petitions Committee's acts. And an analogy, I think that can be applied to the Ombudsman, which puts it pretty outside of the realm of judicial review. So this great independence is based, basically, the Ombudsman needs to be brought into office by the European Parliament. The hearings are extremely important. And the Ombudsman's position lives off the credibility of the institution, the credibility of living up to the own standards. In that context, of course, these credibility of action lives off the two types of powers, the adjudicative role, complaints procedures, so providing non-judicial but still predominantly adjudicated modes of individual redress. After all, when the Ombudsman deals with a complaint, the Ombudsman has to take sides to a certain degree. Obviously, the Ombudsman is obliged to first and foremost find a seek and find a friendly solution, but that does mean acting as a mediator in the sense of mediateur in the French sense of the word. And the ease of the access to the Ombudsman is one very important part of it. But the other important part of it, and that puts the Ombudsman's office aside and next, and in a way, in from that angle at least, above judicial review. Because the Ombudsman has one very, very powerful tool. It can look at the follow-up can see whether actually the proposal has been complied with, which has been made. So this is an, a unique feature in the sense that the institution concerned, we look at the statutes of the Ombudsman, must provide the Ombudsman with a detailed opinion within three months of what has happened. And Ombudsman O'Reilly was just telling us the case of the European Central Bank, coming back to an own initiative report. That would be a very positive example of uh, uh, the, the institution coming back to the Ombudsman with a detailed uh, uh, opinion of how to react. And the Ombudsman has, of course, the possibility of making special reports and engaging the public through the media uh, in informing about ongoing uh, maladministration. So this is an extremely important tool which fits into the overall role of improvement of public administration, of bringing forward the ideas of good administration, which, as the Ombudsman Sudaman was explaining is this revolutionary element in a Charter of Fundamental Rights, which, however, in the moment still, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights up here with <coughs> arguably highly publicity value, and we have the Ombudsman's actions down here. We are still missing the intermediate, the Code of Good Administrative Practice or the Code of Administrative Procedures of the European Union to make sure that this gap between the fundamental rights and the day-to-day -day is actually filled. When we look at the levels of review, Ombudsman Suleiman, you've been developing that uh, beautifully. The idea, of course, we have to start with the rule of law, the principle of legality, observing that all procedural and substantive rights of individuals, including the fundamental rights, are complied with. But obviously, um, the idea is that um, the... Uh, uh, not anything which is legal has to be good administration. There's a huge scope of matters which can be, by the strict criteria of legality, be found legal, but do not automatically exclude maladministration. And in a way, this distinction, as much as I like to buy into it, I see overstressing it causes problems. Uh, my favorite case for that is the Tillak dispute many years ago, journalist Tillak, who was investigating maladministration um, and uh, uh, various problems. Um, when Olaf came back uh, and was investigating him for bribery, the ombudsman found 
uh, uh, serious problems with the investigation uh, in both Olaf and the Commission, but the General Court dismissed that entirely, that report, and would not uh, take it into account as evidence in any way um, in its judicial review. That, I think, was a dark hour, uh, and I see that things are uh, improving, at least in, in, in the context, but we have to keep in mind how this um, relation between illegality and maladministration can be, can be developed. So, the idea of not only rights, but the idea of fairness, non-discrimination, diligence and care are very important, are being developed as general principles uh, by the Court of Justice, and therefore this interaction between the judiciary and the Ombudsman function is very important. Now, when we look at levels of review, obviously what we heard from the two Ombudsmen is extremely important. The idea of an open and transparent union and an open and transparent administration has to be at the core of uh, activities. Um, and in that sense, it was extremely important that the first Ombudsman Suleiman really was pushing to an, for an open, accountable, efficient and service-minded administration, um, which not only includes this access to documents aspect, one of the key important traditions of the Nordic tradition, which came in with the enlargement of, of 95 strongly into the, into the Union, but also by pushing for transparency in the sense of structural, institutional transparency. And that, um, Ombudsman Arali, I found very interesting in your um, uh, work so far and what you've been developing today, that the idea that individuals have to be able to understand what is going on and have to have access to the information of what is going on is a key feature because we all know the difficulties with transparency. It was reference made to the Bavarian Lager case, but there are many other problems, of course, with um, access to documents, not even knowing what kind of documents there are, secrecy, declaration of, 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 uh, and classification of documents, all issues which hamper access to documents and which are very much being under political threat in the moment in the legislative procedures as to the reform of the relevant legislation. So I think that's an extremely important area. Now, um, I'll skip over the, the various aspects of statistics of how um, complaints are coming in and how many are being handled. I think we're, we, can, we can be discussing that. But um, uh, there are some problematic areas and some important areas, I think, uh, I would like to spend uh, a few minutes on just in the sense of not being trying to be complete, but trying to throw a few points uh, of discussion out there for, for our day. Now, um, one area which um, is very strongly developed, and I think uh, uh, I can only uh, applaud uh, uh, Ombudsman Suleiman for his efforts in developing the European network of ombudsmen. Um, it's, it's supported by activities of the national and regional ombudsman um, and, uh, and uh, was exist explicitly developed to address the potential lacunae in supervision of administrative activity, um, which arises out of the fact that administrative procedures in the European Union are highly integrated. Most policy areas you can look at, there is some kind of information exchange, some kind of joint um, uh, networks, uh, some kind of, of, of composite procedures in the sense that procedures start on one level, get input from another level, and are, are finalized on, on, on a third level. But all of our political and judicial review bodies are organized on a two-level basis. They are either national or European. So the problem is that we have a highly integrated executive branch of powers, and parliaments and the judiciary are two-level. And in that gap, exactly, the Ombudsman network comes into. But despite all efforts of, and we see that in the reports, if I just read the, the report of the 4th of May of Ombudsman O'Reilly on the Frontex, um, questions of repat uh, repatriation would be, uh, the one using already the euphemism, bringing back people to where they came from after having found refuge in the European Union. When we read that, we find that the Ombudsman relies heavily on reports and input in, of information coming from the National Ombudsman, which is wonderful. But when we look at the real possibilities of review, we see that still there are elements missing. We have the possibility of 
national ombudspeople and special procedures which were developed um, to ask written answers to queries about European law and send those to the ombudsman, which then either answers themselves, the European ombudsman, I mean, or sends them on to other institutions. But what we not have is the possibility of a vertical and horizontal reference so that the ombudsman can refer to each other cases, bring them back up, or jointly investigate them with having a joint decision. It's either the European ombudsman or the national ombudsman taking a decision. I think here we can really imagine uh, further work, further proceduralization of that approach, which could also stand as a model at the end of the day, if it works successfully, to reform procedures before the Court of Justice, because the Court of Justice has the same kind of problem, that we have a preliminary reference procedure from member states' courts to the Court of Justice, but not the other way around, and not horizontally between member states in cases of joint action. So if the Ombudsman's network could move ahead there and show how it would work, also procedurally, Maybe that could be taken up later on in a reform of the court proceedings. Now, the own investigation uh, 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 is, of course, an extremely important type of action next to handling complaints. Um, and the Frontex case I was just mentioning is also an example of what it can serve to do. It can serve specifically to undertake investigations on behalf of people who cannot complain themselves, either legally or practically. Uh, the refugees here, which were handled by Frontex, can't practically complain to the Ombudsman or seek judicial review. So therefore, this kind of activity is extremely important. It's extremely important in the sense of furthering the concept of our legal system to make it more transparent, both with access to documents as well as the idea of transparency, the structural transparency of the system, but also with regard to taking up cases which cannot be handled themselves. So I think we should very much, when reflecting about the powers and the possibilities of the Ombudsman in regard to the democracy and accountability of the European Union, understand that the possibilities of the Ombudsman to work rely on cases being brought to the Ombudsman and the accumulation of individual complaints being able to lead to the identification of serious endemic problems, which then can be taken up by uh, more systematic reports. The cases of looking into infringement procedures and complaints about infringement procedures to the Commission are important. Jakob, uh, um, um, Ombudsman Anik uh, Forest Diamandouros has famously developed a list of criteria of what to do. The Ombudsman uh, O'Reilly was talking about also looking at citizens' initiatives. And I can only say by looking at legislation, this is extremely important because the attempt of the institutions in legislative acts which are passed are to roll back the powers of the citizens with regard to infringement complaints. When you look at the latest state aid procedural regulation of 2013, you find exactly those elements which were argued by Nikiforos Diamanduros, saying that where there are complaints, we need a clear structure of ensuring that individual rights in the complaints are um, taken uh, and are protected. When we look at the state aid procedural rules there in legislation, exactly the individuals have been relegated to pure information providers and their rights have been cut down by comparison to the previous situation. So it's important to keep in mind that there is a counter push in that area and this has to be developed. Therefore, I happily conclude that much needs to be done. And I can only wish you great success with the next years. I won't say so many, how many, because I'm sure there will be many, many more than 20. Um, the next years ahead, at least in your mandate, uh, will be full of interesting and important political debates, which are not only relevant for the individual case, but for the systema systemic whole of the European Union and the question of integration of executives and the possibility of concluding important decisions behind closed doors is probably one of the key structural remedies which you can bring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Harvey, for that and for uh, um, 
reflecting on, on the last uh, 20 years and pointing the way forward. I just want to make just a quick comment in relation to, to the network and the, uh, the, the, uh, the idea behind uh, my efforts to um, start uh, a series of what I'm calling parallel investigations with, with the member state. I recognize, of course, all, all the problems that you point to, but I suppose there are two reasons for it. One is to, um, to uh, make even better use of the, of the network as, as a resource. Um, I'm always I'm somebody who's very fond of having concrete outcomes to, to the work that we do. Um, and also, in, in the case of that particular um, investigation, uh, what it did do, which is something we hadn't anticipated when we started, was that it actually um, uh, conscientized a lot of the, 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 the national ombudsman to actually what was going on. Some of them weren't actually aware that this was happening in, in their own member states. Um, uh, others did have actually a role as, as monitor and so on. And while I agree that there, there's no central point to which we can direct all of these collectively, our feeling was that you know, a series of single reports, including one from the European Ombudsman, would help enable individual member state ombudsmen to put greater pressure on, on, their, on their authorities in relation to that. So it was sort of a, a group effort, uh, even though I, I, I take the point that you're making. The second point you, you made in relation to what you described as the, the dark hour, um, my colleague here beside me wondered, was it the dark hour for the ombudsman or the dark hour for the court? Uh, <laughs> perhaps to be discussed over lunch. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, well, thank you very much indeed. And now, um, if I get my cue right for once, um, I'd like to call, begin the second session and call on Professor Ziller to, uh, to chair this. Thank you very much.